So on today, we're going to talk about um, under the uh, sermon series title, A Living Sacrifice, the sacrifice of love the Lord, love thy neighbor. Love the Lord and love thy neighbor. In the book of Joshua, Joshua, the book of Joshua can basically be summarized in two chapters in basically two, two sets of scriptures. In chapter one, he tells us to be, be strong and to be courageous. Be strong and be courageous. Chapters one, verses six through nine. Be strong, be courageous, and prosper. But then at the end of the uh, book of Joshua in Chapter 20, verse 24, verse 15, and I'm reading from the New King James Version. He says, you know, I know, I know y'all been through a lot. I know y'all been through a lot, and you've had many challenges. But he tells them, if it seems evil or undesirable to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourself this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your fathers that you serve that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But he makes it clear. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As for me and my house, y'all serve whoever you want to. He says, if it's undesirable for you or you think it seems evil, you serve whoever you want to. If, if serving God seems evil, go ahead. He said, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So my first point is this, decide, decide this day whom you're going to serve. Now, as a baby Christian, you may say, you know, I'm not really sure who, what I want to do. But as we mature, decision should be a process and a decision we've already made. You wake up in the morning and say, Lord, thank you that I woke up with my mind stayed on you. When it comes to someone working in the electrical field, there's a thing called a difference of potential, a difference of potential. That means when you touch a live wire, anybody in here ever been shocked before? It doesn't feel good, does it? <laughs> and electricity will talk to you real quick. But every year, hundreds of people are electrocuted. Now, shock means you survive. Electrocution means you die. But hundreds of people are electrocuted because what happens is electricity when it touches your body, wants to go to ground. And I mean, literally, it wants to go to the ground. So you touch something that's live, and it wants to go to something that's dead. The body, the human body cannot accept, let's just say 7,000, or when I work for the power company, 19,000 volts. Your body cannot survive that. So it wants to pass through you. We cannot continue to hold on to something that's live and something that's dead. If, you're, if it's on a, a day like today and all of a sudden your lights just go out, chances are maybe a bird or a squirrel or maybe the wind blows a tree branch over and it touches the power line. And it's because that bird or that squirrel has touched something live and touched something dead. It just touched the power lines and touched something else at the same time. We can't touch the live thing and touch the dead thing and think we're going to continue to live. So God is saying you have to decide. In Luke chapter, 20, chapter 10, verse 25, behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him saying, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus, in this passage, he turns it back on the lawyer. He said, what is, the, what is written in the law? What is your reading? So he answered and said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength and all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And then Jesus turned around. He said, you have answered rightly. Do this and you shall live. Do this and you shall live. So what does it mean to love? Love the Lord thy God. We say we love a lot of things. Oh, man, I love me some ribs. You know, McRib is back in season, y'all, in case you want to go to McDonald's. I love me some McRibs, man. Don't, you know something? You can't eat a McRib in your car. You got to go home and, you know, anyway. Love me some McRibs, man. I love me some fried chicken. I love me some love, love. It's a word we throw out. But we say we love the Lord. 
And, and I asked the Lord, and you know, before I could really ask the Lord, the Lord just said, I'm going to give you an example. Lord, how do we love you? And the Lord said, do this. He said, strap a GoPro on somebody, you know, a, a recorder and a microphone. He said, strap a GoPro on somebody for 24 hours, not including mealtime and not even Sundays. He said, strap a GoPro on somebody for 24 hours and see what they do. In 24-hour period time, they never pray, they never pick up their Bibles, they never mention his name, and they never witness. So you say you love God, but you never read, you never study. God is not in your life because, and he said, prayer time. Well, people, we pray over our food because we were taught as children to pray over our food. We go to church on Sunday because we were brought up to go to church on Sunday. But we say we love God, but never pick up our Bibles. We never pray. By the way, Pastor Wendy and I, you know, we came to church together, but I haven't talked to her in, in five or six days. I haven't spoken to her. We haven't been communicating. You know, I just go by there and get some new, some, some clean clothes and, you know, check and see if the laundry is done and all of that other stuff. Does that sound like I love her? It doesn't. There has to be ongoing communication. Being absent and, and not having a real relationship with God, it's like a funeral procession. You know, if somebody says, hey, you know, um, I got to go out of town um, because I'm going to support this friend whose you know, relative died. And, you know, it's like two states away. You don't even know this place. So, you know, when you come out of the church, the funeral director tells you, all right, look. You know, you, you get in line and you follow the car behind you or you follow the car in front of you, turn your headlights on and just, you know, and it's about a 10 minute drive. And you're like, OK, fine, no problem. And so you're so busy talking and all this other stuff and you got your phone out and all this other stuff. And before you know it, you're going down the road and you're not paying attention. You never turned your headlights on. You don't know who you're following. And you're like, man, I thought they said this was going to be like 10 minutes. And before you know it, it's like 30 minutes, and you don't know who you're following. Anybody ever had that happen? And then, you know, people, will, people don't care. They cut in front of you. And because we wait so long in, in between those times of praying and getting before God, we get frustrated. It's like, Lord, where are you? And God's like, I told you to get in line. I told you to turn your lights on. I told you to follow the person in front of you. And then you get in those neighborhoods and you're like, oh, this must be getting close to the cemetery. And your following is like, oh, man, OK, well, we must be we must be getting close. We must be getting close because of this van I'm following in front of me. It, they're stopping and they, they keep going and they're stopping. OK, well, they must be pulling over the side. And, and all of a sudden people just keep coming to this van. It's like this guy must be real popular. Because everybody keeps stopping and coming up to the van. He must be real popular, and they're showing their condolences. And finally, you get a phone call, and they say, man, where are you? It's been two hours. And it's like, man, I'm just waiting for this van. It's like, what van? The van in front of me. It's like they, they just keep stopping and offering condolences. And they keep going up a little bit, and they keep stopping. It's like, man... That van is not in a procession. Come to find out, it's not in a funeral procession. It's the ice cream truck. <laughs> because we are not focused on what God is telling us to do. And we get so detached. Everybody else is off doing what they're supposed to be doing. And we're not hearing from God. When it comes to deciding... You hear people say, you know something? I'm turning over a new leaf. I'm going to turn over a new leaf. If you can walk up to a bush and turn over a new leaf, turn over a leaf, what's going to happen? If you turn, go up to a bush and turn over a new leaf, turn over a leaf, what's going to happen? It's going to turn back over, right? But every leaf that you can turn over is where? It's on the ground. If the leaf that you can turn over 
is on the ground, that means it's what? It's dead. Why do you want to turn over a dead leaf? Every leaf that you can turn over is on the ground and it's dead. Why are we trying to turn over dead things? We're always listening to somebody. We're always obeying somebody, but who are we listening to? Are we listening to our friends? Are we listening to our family? They say, oh, and I promise you this. If it's on the Internet, it's true. I promise you that. I read it on the Internet. But our problem is not with sin. We don't have a sin problem. Our problem is with obedience. If we obey God, we don't have a problem with sin. Genesis 2, 15. Then the Lord took God. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden to tend and to keep it. Then the Lord God commanded the man saying, of every tree in the, in the garden, you may freely eat. But of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat, you shall surely die. If, God, if Adam would have obeyed, he would not have sinned. If we obey God, we won't have a problem with sin. I get crickets. <laughs> it's an obedience thing with God. Because obedience is better than the sacrifice. There is a cost for our disobedience. In 1 Kings chapter 13, it's too much to read, but the Bible talks of a man, and the Bible only calls him a man of God. He never mentions his name. It just says a man of God. He goes to King Jeroboam, and he tells King Jeroboam because of all this evil, he says the altar is going to end up splitting. And the king says, well, look, um, Please don't do this. It's going to happen. Boom, the altar splits. And afterwards, he says, okay, I'm sorry for what I did. Please stay. And the man of God says, no, God told me, don't stay. Don't eat any of your food. I'm fasting. I'm leaving. He says, please stay. No, got to go. So he leaves. Another man, an old prophet, Bible never mentions his name. He just mentions him as an old prophet, says, I hear about what happened. So he tells his sons, saddle my donkey. Or where did they go? He says, we don't know. Well, he, we heard he went this way. They say, saddle my donkey. I want to go find this man. They go and, he goes and he finds him. He finds the old man sitting underneath a tree. He's tired. He's weary because he's been fasting. He's following after God. Once he finds him, he says, hey, I want you to come to my house and we can eat. And the man of God says, no, I can't because the Lord has given me specific instructions not to follow anyone but to do my assignment. And he says, but I, too, am a man of God, and God is telling you to come to my house. So he comes to his house and he eats. And while he's eating, the Lord speaks to the old prophet and says, God says, because you have disobeyed me, you will not be buried with your fathers. And as he's going home, the man of God is attacked by a lion. The lion leaps up, knocks the man off of his donkey, and he dies. This is what disobedience will cost us. Now, are you going to get knocked off, off of your donkey? Are you going to die in a car accident? Probably not. But we lose out on our blessings because of our disobedience. When God tells you to do something, that's what God wants you to do. God says, hey, I want, you to, I want you to turn down lunch today. I want you to just turn down your plate today. And that's the day that everybody at work says, we're going to the buffet. They ain't never went to the buffet today on, at lunchtime. And that's the day they say they're going to the buffet. And you, that's the day you have to say, no, I'm not going. I'm not going. I'm, I'm going to just stay and I'm going to sit here. Oh, come on, come on. We'll pay for it. It's our treat. No, 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 no. I'm good. And God's going to bless you. My second point is this. Dedicate. 
dedicate. Genesis chapter 12, verse 2. Now the Lord said to Abram, get out of your country, from your family and from your father's house, to the land which I will show you. Verse 2. And I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. You have to dedicate your life to God. You have to dedicate your life to God. What you used to do, the friends that you used to have. And trust me, that doesn't mean you get all new friends because those friends need salvation too. Now, you can't do the same things you used to do. You can't go and do the same to the same places you used to go to. But you don't get rid of all your old friends if they're dragging you down. Y'all follow me? Come on, y'all. Yeah. Psalm 63 and 1. Oh, God, you are my God. Early, I, early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. Dedicate. Now, one version says, sincerely or earnestly will I seek you. I like this version because it says, early will I seek you. Does it mean first thing in the morning? No, it means early. Early will I seek you. You don't wait until you get in an accident to say, hmm, I think I need to get some insurance on my car. You don't wait until, you know, your stomach starts acting up before you realize, oh, I shouldn't have ate that ice cream. Maybe I should have took some lactate, you know, if you're lactate intolerant. You don't wait until you get in the 11th grade to decide, well, I think I need to figure out what I'm going to do with my life. You start taking those courses ahead of time. Early, early, the Bible tells us to pray without ceasing, pray without ceasing, that God can prepare you for the day, that God can prepare you for those situations which we know we're going to face. The enemy is walking about doing the same thing he's been doing since the beginning of time, seeking whom he may devour. And guess what? The same tricks he's been using on us yesterday, last year, 20,001, and so on and so forth, he's going to keep using them, and we're going to keep falling for them. So we have to continue to seek him early, early. To dedicate means to love the Lord with all of our heart. All of our mind, all of our soul, all of our strength. I had to have some words with Sister Almeida. <clears throat> you know, you just got to get firm with leadership every now and then. <laughs> Let them know who's boss. Because there's a song, and whenever, whenever I hear it, it just... There's just that one, those songs, I'll say, that when you hear them for you, it's, it just makes you stop what you're doing. And when I hear those chords, it just makes me, it just makes me stop and reverence God. But when I hear them, <clears throat> and you did an excellent job, God bless you, sis. But when I hear these words, because all my life, you have been faithful. All my life, you have been so, so good with every breath that I am able. I will sing of the goodness of God. Because all my life, you have been faithful. With all my life, you have been so, so, so good. 
with every breath that I am able, with every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. But then, why ain't they got more registers open? <laughs> God is good, but they need to open up some more registers. When are they going to fix this road? I pay taxes. When are they going to fix this road? I can't believe they ain't fired her yet. All that. They, they know what she's doing. I, I'm a Christian, but I, I mean, I had to tell them. They know what she's doing. But all my life, you have been faithful. You've been so, so good. And with every breath I'm able, I'm going to sing of your goodness, Lord. But they need to get it right. They need to get their act together. We can't, do, we can't be both ways, y'all. We have to dedicate. We have to dedicate our lives to God. And then finally, we have to demonstrate. Point number three, we need to demonstrate. In the same passage of Scripture, going back to Luke chapter 10, the lawyer, wanting to justify himself, he says to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Then Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down to Jerusalem from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among thieves, who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now, by chance, a certain priest came down the road, and when he saw him, he passed on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at that place, came and looked and passed on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, had compassion. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring, pouring on oil and wine. And he, set on him an anim- and he set him on his animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. On the next day, when he departed, he took, him, he took out two denarii, gave, him, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, said to him, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come, I'll repay you. So which of these three do you think was a neighbor to him who fell, on, who fell among the thieves? And he said, he who showed mercy to him. Then Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. Go and do likewise. I'm a big proponent of Matthew 4 and, 4, 4 and 5 and 46, and I don't have it in there, but it says, if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Now, it's important, and Pastor Wendy and I really believe, and I believe every pastor believes, that the saints should know each other. You should fellowship with each other. Get to know each other. But if... The people on this side only talk to the people on this side, and the people on this side only talk to the people on that side. You know what that is? It's called a click. And you may not think of it that, well, we only talk to these people. It's called a click. And you may think it's harmless, but it's a click. But in all that we talked about, the priest and the Levite and the and the Good Samaritan. Let me ask this question. When was the last time you performed a physical act for a total stranger? I don't mean, hey, how you doing? Good morning. You actually performed a physical act for a total stranger. Did you walk by somebody and say, here, let me get that for you? You saw somebody in Walmart, maybe somebody in one of those scooters, and you asked them, hey, can I get that off the shelf for you? We're not looking for that person 
who's totally disabled or that person who's been beaten down, who's been robbed and left for dead and saying, oh, well, when that happens, yeah, I'll go save them. Even the world recognizes, oh, they call them random acts of by, uh, <laughs> random, God forgive, random acts of kindness. Oh, you're paying it forward. The world recognizes that. But we are to present our bodies as a living sacrifice. We should be doing much more. Hey, why are you doing that? Why are you doing that? Because for God so loved the world that he gave. He gave. I'm doing this because that's what my father told me to do. I gave. I gave. I give because my father gives. I'm doing it because this is what my father does. This is, what my fa- this is how my father raised me. We sit here and we watch the world pour out and pour out and give to each other, and we're just standing by. Now, I understand for women, it's different. You know, you don't go willy-nilly and just start doing things unless you truly feel you're led by God or unless you have somebody with you. But the priest and the Levite, they they just walk by and they say, oh, well, he, he didn't ask for help. Oh, I'm on my way to church. I might get my garments dirty. Oh, he looked like he going, well, even if I called 911 right now, he probably wouldn't make it. We have all types of reason, all types of excuses of why we won't help people. Oh, I'm going to just call 911, let the police handle it. This is a police matter. But did, did we even stop and pray? Do we even stop and pray? So just something to think about. When was the last time we performed a physical act for a complete stranger? That's your homework assignment. So Matthew 25 and 33. And he set and he will set on and he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. And the king will say to those on his right hand, come, you be blessed of my, of my father. Inherit the kingdom. Prepare for you from the foundations of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer and saying, Lord, when did I see you? When did, mm, Lord, when did you see, uh, mm, Lord, when did you, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say unto them, or surely I say as much, in as much as you did come, I'll get that. As the, as the least of these. <laughs> Brethren, you did it unto me. You did it unto me. You did it unto me. When we do it unto a stranger, we're doing it unto Jesus. Not to be seen of other people. Some people think, you know, if they take the trash out, there's a, there's, a custodian at their job, but they think, you know, they see trash on the floor and they think, and they see it and they're like, oh, I'm not picking it up. That's what the janitor's for. No, when you pick it up, that's an act of kindness. And God rewards you for that. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. We pray that you've all gotten something out of this message. I hope we understand that that we have to live a living, we have to present our body as a living sacrifice. We have to decide, we have to dedicate, but then mostly we've got to demonstrate it. We have to demonstrate. Anybody can hear it, but James said, be doers of the word. And not just hearers only. 
And Jesus said in Mark 4, the sower soweth the word, he says that immediately, immediately, the enemy is going to come and try to take this word out of you. So the best thing to do is start practicing it. Start using it. Start practicing it. Start using it. 